This is an interview with Eugene Hauser on March 7, 2008. We're in the studio at WILL TV in Campbell Hall, Urbana, Illinois. Henry Radcliffe is doing the videotaping, and my name is Nancy Rotzel. Okay, World War II. Where were you when it started? I still probably still in high school when it started. Yes, I was because we didn't get involved until '41. But in '41, I happened to be over at the university at Purdue when Pearl Harbor was bombed. Well, how did you find out about it? It was on the radio, I guess. Cause they didn't have TV at that time. Huh. Yeah. Do you remember the reaction to it? No, I wonder what effect it was going to have on all of us. Yes. A lot of talk on campus? Oh, yeah. And how did you get involved? Well, oh. I got through, I finally got through the university and uh, was drafted at the end. I was out in the, in the field, my father was handicapped, came out with walking with a crutch and had a notice from the draft board to, to appear for induction and he wanted me to apply for deferment and I, I said, no, I can't, I've got to go. What year was that? It was in 44. And, and you were in, in the field where? In Farmer City, on the farm in Farmer City, yeah. And from there, in October, it was October then, <coughs> I went to Camp Atterbury in Indiana was for the induction center. And at Camp Atterbury, we moved to, didn't know where we were going until we got to Atlanta, the rail yards. They, somebody said, well, you're going up to Camp Croft in South Carolina. So I had a basic training in Camp Croft, trained as an infantry scout. And that's where you're supposed to get all the intelligence and go up in front and see what's going on and report back. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> At the end of the basic training, we moved to Camp Patrick Henry and then shipped out from Newport News, Virginia, on the USS America, some probably 5,000 replacements. They weren't units then, they were just replacements to fill in the vacancies in, in the units from the combat. One member of the, of the crew was Red Skelton, the, camp, the comedian. He was an army person, served his time in a ship as a, his army duties, and in the mean, all the intervals in between his work and he was entertaining all the troops. By the time we got to Naples, he was exhausted. What was his job on the ship? I don't know. If he was peeling potatoes or what he was doing. But uh, someone got the bright idea as we came to the Straits of Gibraltar at night. They said they'd take a survey and if they got $5 million worth of prudential insurance, if the total prudential insurance had totaled five five million dollars, they would turn the lights on on the on the rock. So we went through. Of course, there weren't any lights on the <laughs> on that because prudential is a rock of Gibraltar is a trademark of prudential insurance. Then we went on to the Mediterranean over to Bay of Naples, where we disembarked. But we couldn't get to the to the dock because of the bay was full of sunken vessels. So we had to pull up to one vessel and put our gangplank down and walk from one vessel to another to another to get to the shore. And then uh, they put us in semi-trailers and hauled us out to 
Count Shiano's dairy farm as the first stage in the area. Count Shiano happened to be the son-in-law of Mussolini. But from the period of time I was in at the dairy farm, it served some time as night guard at the, for the 10th Mountain Division up in the mountains. And from the dairy farm, we moved into Caserta for a st staging area. And that staging area was near the chief headquarters, which is the supreme high command of the Mediterranean Theater. And then from there, we moved up to Naples. <coughs> and uh, before I was assigned to any, any unit, <coughs> In my spare time, I went to the headquarters and helped the troop, off, troop movement officer with his duties. And I found out that there was a vacancy in the headquarters for a typist. So I said, well, I can learn, I can, I can type. So they got assigned to the forms writing unit, which cut orders for incoming troops and sent these with their orders, send them up to, to the front or wherever they're, they're needed, wherever the replacements were needed. That was the forms writing unit. And uh, becoming a, a typist, I got rid of my scout MOS, became a clerk typist. Uh, kind of an envious position if you're not, rather than going up to the front with a rifle, and from Naples, we received troops coming in, because that was a port, and sent them up to the front, and we received troops coming back from the front who had enough points to be dis discharged, or they were being transferred to the, to the Pacific Theater. Whenever a ship came in with troops, we loaded up with people going back, <coughs> whether those ships were victory ships or liberty ships or battleships or aircraft carriers. Aircraft carriers would take eight or ten personnel back to the States. How did you decide which, which ones were going to go or where to place them? On their, as they came into the depot. So they needed a certain number of points to go home. Yes. And when they when you were sending them in as replacements, uh, how did you know which ones went where? Well, if they, if they had enough points, they came to us and, and we sent them home. And we'd send up replacements for those people. Um, and those who didn't have enough points, had a few points were, of course, transferred to the, to the Pacific Theater because they, they were starving for replacements out there. We had we had personnel on Iwo Jima, of it, and uh, uh, New Guinea. We had fellows on New Guinea that were fighting hand to hand for thirty six or thirty eight days without any replacements because all the replacements are going to Europe. And finally when Europe became, was liberated, then we sent the replacements out to the, to the Pacific Theater. My job as a, type, as a typist just was a, just an eight hour shift, very, very lenient. In our spare time we at Naples we could on the weekends, we can go out to uh, Pompeii to learn all about Pompeii or climb Mount Vesuvius, uh, the uh, lava crusted shore, uh, banks of, of the Mount Vesuvius, or climb up there and look inside, see all the steam squirting out. Or we could take a, on another weekend, we could take a PT boat and go to. Isle Capri, and uh, then 
Oh, that, in Naples, the area we were involved with was the, and Mussolini had, was going to have a World's Fair, and so they had a lot of fancy buildings and auditoriums and and buildings. We used those, <coughs> and then uh, we were moved up to. Uh, Florence, but while still while we were in Naples, we had R and R every three months. We could go up to Rome for a week, and in Rome, uh, before going to Rome, I went to the Red Cross because I didn't know anything what about Italy or what about Rome. So I went to the Red Cross and looked in the encyclopedias. What was there in Rome? And of course, there's the Vatican and all the ruins. So when I went to Rome, <clears throat> first thing I did was went to the St. Peter's Cathedral and uh, saw the Swiss guards. <clears throat> and my ancestries or ancestors are Swiss. So I took it upon myself to go into the Swiss canteen. I was in uniform. Went into the canteen where the Swiss guards rested and had coffee and so forth. And I asked if any of them could speak English, and uh, they referred me to a Smith Oya, Noya. And we visited for a couple of hours. He said, if you, tomorrow's my day off. If you come back, I'll take you on a tour of Rome. So we saw Rome by on foot with a Swiss guard as a guide. Thought that was unique, <laughs> and uh, then from Naples we moved up to Florence for two months, and uh, doing the same thing, processing troops. And on the weekends we'd go into Florence and get our hair cut and uh, tour the Pizzi Palace and see the Ponte Vecchio. Got very acquainted with Florence and the city of Florence. And then uh, we moved to Marina di Pisa. And there we were stationed on a farm, and in the second floor of the, of the barn where we slept, we could look out the window and we could see the Leaning Tower. Uh, <clears throat> of course, on the weekends, we'd go into Pisa. And I had the pleasure of climbing this, the circular stairway clear to the top of the, the tower. And the, the huge bells up there that they rang. So we would get a, on the arm of the bell and get this thing swinging, and it would swing us. It would pick us up the floor, and we'd swing back and forth on that big B bell. The, the, Natives didn't like that, or the the the, Pisa, the Pisans didn't like that because they used the bells for emergencies. Mm. If we were up there ringing the bells, that wasn't protocol. Uh, and later on, they found out that the ringing the bells deteriorated the foundation, or it wasn't good for the stability of the of the tower. And maybe 40 years later, they prohibited anybody from climbing the tower until they found out how to stabilize it. Uh, how did you keep track of what was going on in the different theaters of war? Well, that came down through the... Well, we had the Stars and Stripes, the, mag the, daily, the daily paper, and... Uh, we kept track of the progress up there and in the Pacific. And of course, we read Bill Malden's cartoons of William Joad. And I got three or four books of his. When I went from, from uh, then we moved on into Leghorn, Italy, which is another port city. And ships would come in there and we, we'd process troops again. And on R and R, I we had one R and R that went to Switzerland, a tour, a week, one week tour. 
And if we had Swiss relatives, a blood relative, we could stay with the blood relative instead of staying with the, with the tour. And so a distant cousin of mine became a grandfather. And so I was able to stay with him. And he took us around to where our ancestors grew up and went to school and went to church in Schwarzenberg and at Rigersburg. And I met a couple younger cousins that were going to the Polytechnic in Zurich studying for their market deg doctor's degrees. And we became fast friends and he came over here after the war several times as he was a associated with the Stanford Research Institute. He represented the, the Near East for the Stanford Research Institute. But anyway, I think I had two R&Rs in Switzerland. How did, how did the Swiss feel about the Americans? Well, they were neutral. They th so they didn't have any opinion on the war? I mean, personally. They were there. Our, our relatives were friendly because we were making progress getting the, the Nazis out of. My grandfather there had a car, but it was in the garage covered with the canvas and up on, on blocks because they couldn't drive it during the, during the war. So we took a train every place. Uh, What year was this by this point? This is in 45 and 46. In uh, 45, Roosevelt died while I was on the, in, in route to Italy. In April 45, was it? And uh, What was the reaction to that? Well, he, be, he became one of us then. He was just a person a body that passed on. So we were wondering about who was going to replace him because uh, he'd been in president for, what, four terms? Uh, Do you think that there was a reaction to who his replacement was? Yeah. Did you even know it? Did you know much about him? No, we didn't know much about Truman. Uh -uh. But back to uh, you talking about the reaction of the Swiss people. Switzerland was neutral, and uh, we weren't allowed to fly over Switzerland. But one of our planes, our bombers, did fly over the and uh, the aircraft crew radioed up to him, and oh, they fired at him. And he said, uh, you're flying over Swiss territory. We're going to fire on you. And they did, and he says, your, your, your shells are bursting at 21,000. I'm, I'm flying at 24,000. And they said, we know it. <laughs> uh, How big was the office that you, you keep saying we moved from here to there? How big was the office you were in? How many people? Oh, there's, I think there's four or five typists. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd cut metal plates, put their information on it. And those, when they came into, into our uh, depot, they filled out a form. And we... Uh, put their name and address, their brother, like on the dog tag, they had their, their name and their, their uh, religion and their blood type on these plates. And, and off these plates, we, they'd get their name and, and put them on a, with an address or grappling machine. We'd cut the long troop movement orders. And then the next day, we'd go out and, and uh, call off the names and put them on the trucks. 
And then uh, Leghorn, well, every every evening I'd check the, the incoming troops for anybody who, from DeWitt County or Farmer City. Or, and I happened to find one of, was uh, Kenneth Westray from the DeWitt County, had been the DeWitt County Sheriff. And he was in the MPs in the, in the Army. So I went over, over to where he was barracked that evening and, and told him it's who I was and, and that he was going to ship out on a certain ship the next day. And he said, well, this is the first time in my four years in the service that I knew what was going to happen to me the next day. While he was in service, his wife was the sheriff of DeWitt County. Interesting facts like that. We. Um, uh, he's the only person you ever met? Uh, only, the only one from Illinois, too? Or were there others? Well, that, there are a lot of them from Illinois and all, all over the state. So I became acquainted with all the forts because we would send them to Fort Dix or Fort Monmouth or all that. I became a acquainted with all those names. But, and uh, for Illinois, we sent them to Fort Sheridan or, or uh, Great Lakes. How did, how did anybody keep track of how many points somebody had to know the standard That was by the, by the months service overseas and the battles, I think maybe the battles were counted, and uh, the number of children that you had at home. So they, each of them counted so many points. And, and I don't remember the, the high points, what they were, but we'd ship home the high pointers, and then they kept reducing to the, down to the low ones. Well, I just wondered where the records were kept, because you didn't have a computer in the, in the to pull it all up. In the headquarters of each battalion. And it was all done on paper. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It followed, the, it followed each soldier. Their records did. And uh, back to Leghorn, uh, I became acquainted with uh, James Kubitsumi, who was a member of the famed uh, 442nd Infantry Regiment, the, the Nisis, the Japanese Americans, who were imprisoned in Idaho. Uh, and so they bunch of them got together and formed the 442nd Infantry Regiment. And they were shipped to Italy and had some of the worst battles, the dirtiest ones. They, they put these, these nieces in. And they had the highest casualties, but they, they're all successful battles. Very outstanding service. But he, Jim was in the Serving his, while he was in the depot, he worked at the motor pool and found out that there, the government was selling surplus vehicles and the surplus Jeeps. And for $150, you could, if you're a sergeant or higher, you could buy a Jeep and it would be sent home as baggage. So Jim picked out a real nice Jeep for me. One that had been in service on the front bumper, it still had the, the post that went up above the, the windshield with a hook on it. So the, when they they drive the Jeep down the, down the road and the Germans would have a piano wire stretched from tree to tree across the road. And this bar would catch that rather than behead the drivers or the Jeep personnel. So the Jeep I got still had this bar on it. So I knew it, it, it had been in service. But I brought it home and and uh, used it for a run around driving livestock and and some field work, pulling, pulling a rotary hoe and so forth for about 10 years until I wore it out. Uh, what rank were you that you were able uh, to get one a, of those? A sergeant. Tex, uh, 
that tech sergeant. And anyway, I got Jim Kubasumi to come get on the, I got him booked on the same ship that I came home on. It was the Lehigh Victory. Took 12 days to do that. And uh, picked up the Jeep, came on home to back to the farm and and got married to Jen, who was a, a former Purdue student. What year was that? That was in 46. She, she always claims that I brought her from Indiana to Illinois to improve the bloodlines. Uh, and then... Uh, did you find it hard to come back and adjust to no. being on the farm? Came right back into the harvest time. <laughs> but my crippled, handicapped father had to put up for two years, put up with whoever was available to help with the farm work. I felt bad about leaving him, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't not serve. Were there a lot of people that you knew from Farmer City who had gone, who were already in the service when oh, you, yeah. friends? Yeah. In fact, uh, about uh, what, 12 years ago, there was a kind of a fair on the main street of Farmer City. And uh, there was a tent next to the library and some of the fellows were out in the tent talking about their World War II experiences. And uh, John Dawson and John Overton were there talking about theirs, and they, and they thought, well, now these stories ought to be written down for, for history. And so John Dawson, John Overton, and Fred Graff started collecting stories and then they needed another accomplice, so I joined them. And it took eight years to get books, uh, stories for our book. Uh, and it was about 1995 or so before the four fellows started talking about their experiences. Some of them were too horrible to talk about, and others they didn't think anybody would be interested in. But we got a couple of them to, t to tell their stories, like from this tent. We recorded those, and then other people heard those stories, and, and they said, well, I, I've got something I can say. And uh, should I say this about Dick Smith, who was farmed south of Parnell for 50 years. He was just a farmer. And uh, I met him in the Carl Clinic in the, in the waiting room, and his grandson and his wife were with him. And I said, Dick, you were in the World War II. Have you recorded your story? And he says, no, nobody, nobody's interested. And I said, you haven't even told your wife what, what you did? And he said, no. And I said, well, Dick, you, sh you should do that. I don't know where you were, but you should write your story. About two weeks later, he gave a story to John Dawson. And a week or so later, he said, I've got some more. I can add to that, that story. And one of the interesting facts was that we learned from him that he had been a, a cook on the Balfin submarine. And for a couple of days, it was docked in the Bay of Naples. And they saw a train go regularly go past on, on, on a trestle. And that was enticing. They, so they got permission, the captain got permission to fire the last torpedo. And they knocked that trestle out from underneath that train. And as far as we know, that was the only submarine that was ever credited with sinking a train. And that same truck. Submarine was out in the, later on was out in the ocean and 
and uh, their compass went out of commission for some reason. And it was a cloudy night. The navigator couldn't find out where he was from the stars. So he told the captain, as far as I know, we're five miles north on the Burma Road. <laughs> What's your book called? My book was called The Rolls, The Rolls Remembered. R-O-L-E-S, The Rolls, that's stories of, the, of what they did. We collected 650 names and uh, all that we could find out about most of them, maybe 400 of them had stories like Dick Smith's or Richard, Dr. Richard Watson's or uh, Bill Howard. Bill Howard came back and became a principal at the, around one of the suburbs, but he was a pilot on the B-17. That was shot down and he saw stayed with the plane until he saw every, all his crew bail out. And then he bailed out, and he saw every one of those parachuting out was killed before, he, before they hit ground. And when he got down to the ground, he as well as some others, the, the natives would come after him with pitchforks or whatever they had. To, to kill them uh, because they had bombed their houses, they bombed their cities. They're real aggravated at the fact that we're, there's a chance to get back at them. So when he said when he was teaching history, modern history in, in school, it came to the World War period, he couldn't talk about it. Is that, that true of a lot of the men that you got to write, that they hadn't talked about it before? Yeah. And they finally loosened up and talked. Do you think it's easier to write about it than talk about it? Uh, yeah, probably. So some of them just gave you the written thing and didn't talk yeah. about it? <clears throat> Another uh, Air Force veteran was Dean, <coughs> excuse me, was Dean Holman. He was his plane was shot down, and as he was uh, floating down from his plane, before he got to ground, a, a German fighter plane passed him. A lot of times, when the German planes would come back and they'd shoot these parachutists, but this one came back and waved to Dean, and so Dean said, "Well, no time to not be cordial," so he waved back to him. <laughs> And when he was, he landed, but he'd been shot in the leg in the, in the POW camp. He, he had to lose one leg. Do you think it helped, helped them to talk about it? Beg your Do you think it helped them to talk about it? I think it? so, yes. Did you, get a, did you all get together at the end of the book? Have another, no. another tent party? No. <laughs> because by that time, in eight years... Many of them had passed on, and that's that's the reason we, 10, 12 years ago, we wanted to get these stories down because they are dying at, veterans are dying at a thousand a day. Uh, is that right? A thousand a day? Pretty, pretty frequently anyway. You see in the newspapers, the obituaries, there'd be a flag with the obituaries. There'd be five or six obituaries with flags on them. So we had to get those stories recorded before they were lost. That's one of the <clears throat> more facts of my life that I was something I was proud to do, to record those. Looking back at it all, what, 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 how do you feel about World War II and being, being well, part it was, of it, it all? It was necessary. We had to... And the country, everybody in the country is involved with it. As, as civilians, they were in munitions or they're assembling jeeps or making tanks. Uh, one of our stories, 
we included others that were in uh, wartime efforts back in the States. One fellow from Farmer City painted war, uh, victory ships up in, in uh, about the plant north of, north of Henry. I forgot the name of it, but they made, Kaiser made victory ships up there. And they floated them down the, the, El, the Illinois River into the Mississippi. But he painted those ships and we included his story in, the, in our book. Did your dad know you were writing it? No, he, was, he, he died. How did he feel when you, he said, what did he say to you when you got home? Welcome home, son. Yeah. How had you kept tapped, or kept track of what was happening at home? Well, we we sent victory letters. We'd write a letter, and then it would be microfilmed, I think, and 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 sent home, and then they'd reconstitute the the victory, the microfilm into a victory letter, and and send it back to the family. Well, we did, when I was in Switzerland one time, I called for $13. You could make a phone call back to the States. So I was there and I uh, made arrangements for it and had Jan went from Indiana back to, to where my folks lived. And I said I'd be calling at a certain hour. And so... Uh, for thirteen dollars, I talked for three minutes to, to the family. Otherwise, it was just by mail. You keep touch afterward. Did you keep in touch with any of the special friends that you'd met? Oh yes. Any in particular? Uh, one was Jim Kobisumi. Pat got Alzheimer's and passed away about two years ago. And uh, two other typists, one of them has died and the other one is, is in Colorado. He came home as a sergeant. <clears throat> and on the GI Bill, he became a, uh, a veterinarian. And after serving, as, working as a veterinarian in the States, he re-enlisted and, and was a officer in the veterinary veterinary corps and he stayed there for his 20 or 30 years I've forgotten how many as retirement that was another buddy did you all get together we visited each other yes once or twice and did you talk about what happened then no we just talked about our families not until the book uh, well, John Dawson. Oh, I should mention John Dawson. He was he was a member of the first Special Service Forces. The Special Service Forces. That one was he was in, he was he was in the first one. They they were trained to do anything. They trained for mountain skiing, or scuba diving, uh, infantrymen. Uh, they were sent to Aleutian, to the Aleutian Islands, and when they got up there, they invaded it, and they found out the Japanese had already abandoned that island, Kisk of the, the island, and they were shipped to Norway for their skiing in their white, u white uniforms and everything for skiing. And then he was down in uh, Italy. Uh, in the, An the battle of the Anzio battle, and uh, into Italy, uh, south of Rome, there's a Mount Defensia, which a that that mountain controlled a main highway from Naples up to to Rome, and the Germans were situated on top of that mountain, and two American divisions and one British division had tried to conquer that mountain, 
but their three divisions were were backed off. And so his special service force, I think there's 1,500 in the in the force. In two days, they repelled straight up on the backside of this mountain. They'd, they'd repel at night and then rest in the daytime and then climb up and again the next the next day. And in two days climbing up and they surprised the Germans and captured them and they had to wait uh, well, several hours before they got reinforcements to to help them. The special service force had had captured them, then they needed American forces to come up and take take over. Uh, and I think one of the generals didn't have anything to do with the special service forces. They thought that they could, do, their men could do the do it. But then after this, uh, not defense you know, campaign, they, the special service force was was accepted. And then, then John Dawson's unit was the first ones to liberate uh, Rome. Is that so in he, the book? He was, he was one of our authors, and we were quite proud to be associated with him. Every time we'd meet, we'd learn more about his experience. About, about taking Mount Defensia and, and fighting on the NCO, they Oh, they were, his unit was the, they claimed the, they came the, I've forgotten. Anyway, they would go out at night and, and uh, capture the Germans, kill, kill the Germans. And they became the Devil's Brigade. There's been a couple of movies made about the Devil's Brigade. And it was, this first service force that John Dawson is a member of. You obviously have a lot of respect for all of the yeah. different experiences and that John people John Dawson, have. the other author, was an interrogator for German prisoners up in Germany. He spoke German? He spoke. Was that something he, he learned no, in order to do that? He, he was taught that two years and in the service, and then they sent him over as an interpreter. If you were going to tell a grandson uh, something about World War II, what would it be? I think I'd have to... My service was not a heroic service. Uh, I'd try to bring out what some of the other soldiers did, but I'd probably tell them that I was a clerk typist and all my education, high school and college, the only course that helped me was my typing course. That got me out of the infantry into as a clerk typist, and just, otherwise I might have been up there in the front. What would you tell them about the whole war, not even just your part of it? Oh. It was, it was a, a conflict in which we had to enter. We were involved in it before the before the war in, in supplying materiel. Then at uh, Pearl Harbor, that be, that broke the bridge, and we had to we had to join the effort then with with personnel. I just tell them that I was proud to serve and uh, hope that he wouldn't have to. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to tell us about? I think that that's about it. Important Agreed. time in your life. Beg pardon? An important time in your life. It was. That Two years, we went. It wasn't by choice that I was 
a clerk typist, but we went where we were ordered. And the saying was, "You, uh, it's not ours, uh, not ours to." Not our choice. What is that? I'd forgotten. The do or die. Yeah, it ends up. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what people did. It's not our, ours to reason why, but ours is to, to do or die, and that's it. Not to reason why. Okay.